Okay, we are live. Thank you everybody for being here. We are doing a quick video for one of our students, Rafael. He's on the on the meeting right now, being a little child, doesn't want to turn his video, but uh, pretty much what we want to do is go over the article from Dev Express about the best practice on XPO. So we're gonna go point by point, tell what we think about it, tell our thoughts, tell how we do it, and go from there. Uh, Jose has the article already up, so I'm gonna pass the the presentation to him and we'll go from there. Feel free, Rafael, to ask any question and I will also comment uh, how I'm used to do things. I do believe that is a great, great resource to come back to it uh, now and then. How's it? Okay, uh, is, I mean, can you see my screen right now? I can definitely see it. Uh, good, so we will start with the first uh, on the list of best practices. You can Google this, you can just write XPO best practices and you will find it. The article is quite old, it's like from 2005. But uh, I will say that like 99% of everything that is in this article is still apply today. So in general, those are like best practices as, as the article said. So, okay, the first best practice is uh, always define a constructor realization parameter in your persistent objects. Uh, actually, Rafael asked me about that uh, like, like three or four days ago. And basically, uh, and also with you, Javier, remember that we were doing some uh, code with reflection and you asked me, hey, the constructor is there, why is it not working? It's because you actually need this, this signature in the constructor, the one that is here, um, this one. Uh, because in general, I mean, if you know how constructors works, basically uh, you initialize properties there. You don't have to mix uh, to confuse it with the after construction, but that's in general how objects are constructed in .NET. So basically, um, whatever you pass to the constructor are the initialization parameters of the object. So you can create an empty, um, like an empty constructor, but you will be able to create an instance of your object, but your object will be created in, in a corrupt way, not in the correct manner. So you always need to do this, like to maybe you can create another permutations of constructor, but you at least have to have this one. I mean, the one that the signature is the session because the session is actually needed to understand the state of the object. If the object is having changed somehow and you need to start the transaction. Uh, so you need that and you need also to rehydrate the, the, uh, the object from the database. So in general, I will not put that as a best practice. I will put it as a must. You have to have it. I Got mean, it. I mean, it will not work correctly if you don't. Uh, don't. And, Jose, and one of the things that we have encountered with our students is that they sometimes have a use entity framework. So they always refer to the session as an analog for the DB context. So it's the mm -hmm. way that you actually connect it to your database. And one thing that I would like to show is a can you click on the link of that article, A751, that explain the section that it gives for when there is not a session parameter on the constructor? It's right there, the first one, okay. that one. Oh, okay. That one will tell you about the section about missing constructor. And not only that, uh, it will tell you that XPO only use the constructor that is using the session. So if you have another constructor that is using name equal anything that is for the developer to be to use, not for XPO. Exactly, I mean, in here, if you have ever read the, if you have ever read the documentation from Prism, uh, the framework for Sam, uh, from Summer India, uh, they, uh, they say that, I mean, if you use dependency injection, for example, uh, your dependency injection service is looking for a signature in the constructor. So it's looking for a specific signature. If you don't have it, uh, you will construct the the object in 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 an incorrect way, basically. So that signature is what is needed in 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 order to be able to have the correct flow. So uh, yes, as you told Javier, is like the other constructor, all the overloads that you can create are for you, the programmer. But XPO, what is looking for is the one with the signature uh, session, and that's it. So. Um, in general, I told you, I don't consider this like as a best practice. It will not work correctly in general if you don't do it. So 
I would consider like a must. You have to have it. You have to do it like that. I mean, you can do other black magic, but uh, in general, if you don't know what you're doing regarding this, just leave it as it is. It's not uh, difficult to put the 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 full construction. Actually, you can generate them with uh, with code rush. So you you only need to make sure that they are public in general. So. I agree. And if you like right click on your business object folder and create a new XPO business object, that will come definitely with the constructor with the session on it. So actually with all the templates, you will see this. So the biggest danger is when you don't use code rush or when you start creating classes from the scratch, like basically like writing the code. Anyway, you can use the XC uh, code rush shortcut to generate the correct class actually with the correct constructor. So uh, I think that's the way to go. Use code rush because it will it, it will do everything in the proper way, actually. All right, I think that's it. Let's move to the next one. Okay, so the second one is use the set uh, property value method instead of the, oh, sorry, no, no. Use the set property value method in a persistent property setter. Okay. I think the best way to say this is just actually go to the definition of that method on the... Okay, uh, I have a Visual Studio here. So let's do an XPS, oops. And name. Okay, so let's go here. This, uh, okay, we have it here. So uh, is there something that you want to see in particular, Javier, here? I, I wanted to see when the on change is being called and everything, but maybe it's Actually, just showing yeah, the metadata uh, here, so. Uh, yes, you, you will not see that, but in general, what you need to understand is that uh, visual controls use the, to understand that they need to refresh the UI or do something they use something called the I notify property change. If you have been in one of our courses, uh, especially the enterprise courses with, with I mean, the class is quite longer. Um, I mean, this, the sessions are quite longer. Uh, we talk a, a lot about the I notify property change because basically that, uh, that interface is used to, to communicate with any visual control. Otherwise, you won't, you won't be able to understand when the object change. So, and that's a few lines of code. For example, let me show you here in, 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 in this solution. So. And actually, if code rush detect that you have the interface I notify probably the chain, it will create the. Yeah, exactly. But I, I want to put it so you, you can see how much code are you saving by doing it like in this way. Because see, okay, the first, uh, property that we put here is a string, right? So just one line, the setter. But if I do it like PS with the Visual Studio shortcut, name two. So what is inside of this is basically something like this. Not exactly those lines, but it's, it works like that. I mean, First, you check if the value is the same, the one that you have in your in your holder or in the field, and the one that is coming. And then if they are the same, you just return because you don't need to notify the UI because nothing have actually changed. But uh, if it's not equal, you need to trigger an event and you will, the event will say like, this property changed with this value. So the, the, the visual representation can do whatever they want, like refresh, calculate, or whatever. So in general, if you use the shortcuts, is one line. If you don't, uh, you have to write something like that. So, but uh, it depends on on how you want to handle it. I will prefer like one line all the time. So both of these will work the same, actually. I don't know if this um, if this uh, will notify the old value 
and the new value because the one that is triggered by this you will see the name of the property that changed the old value and the new value and i think in this one it's not like that so this is also like a, an enhanced version of this so if it's done for us and you're using code rush, i mean if you're using stuff you it's likely that you use code rush. you use the shortcuts i think that's the best way possible one thing that i think that is important to notice here is that not only for visual controls that are binding to your property, XPO needs to know when the property changes so it can actually uh, save that data to the database. So it's not, again, it's not a best practice, it's a most. Even if you don't use the set property value, you do have to implement the I notify property change in your, in your yes, property. Yes, because there is also, and I guess Rafael asked me this also like last week, and uh, with the concept of transactions, database transactions, in XPO, uh, they start automatically when you start changing the data. So to start the transaction automatically, you need to understand when the object uh, has changed. So there's no other way to know that without the iNotify property change. So in general, if you want to write less code, it, the better way is to, or the best way to, to, to do that is to follow the best practices because if you use the correct pattern like notify and like this or even like this here um, you will not lose the uh, the functionality that the start the transaction automatically when an object has changed so to write this code just follow the best practices in general ah and also something that i want to 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 highlight in here. You can achieve this in many ways. You can use any other type of compilation tricks to inject the I notify property change. Right now, there is a big um, uh, boom. <laughs> boom in the internet about the source generator. generator. So in general, you can inject the interface if you want, or you can inject the code in the method. But why should you go to that level if it's already here? So, I mean, you can do it by, if you want to do a research or something, but I think the best way or the most practical way in the day by day basis is just use code rush. Yeah, that's what, that's what Fody does for some. Yeah, no, I, actually I wanted to show Fody. Um, let me open here. Uh, Fody waivers. Okay, so. If you have never used Fodi, it's something that you can use to change how the code is compiled. It will inject something by the end of the compilation, but you will not see that something in the code. So it's generated for you in the assembly. So in here they have, I think the most popular is the iNotify property change, but let's see, here's the list I think of, um, Maybe that one, list of all the uh, yes, wheelers. Yeah, the, Yes. So uh, it's fine. Oh, is that one? I mean, uh, those are like two versions because there are two interfaces: property change it and property changing. So uh, you can use any of those in general, uh, but you will always lose something. Um, it, when you d use something like this, you cannot access the placeholder where the value actually lives. So yes, it will have the same functionality, you, but you will still lose something a little bit. But you have to write less code. That's the 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 thing with this. So I yeah. will recommend I will recommend people to use Fodi if they really know what they're doing. But if you're a uh, a beginner, just use Codrush in general. That's my I mean in my opinion. If I can make your life easier in some way, just use code rush. It does make your life easy. And seeing here, they they have the reactive UI Fodi. That's another nice, another, really, a, really another, nice tool that make your view models real, real clean. So, and actually, Javier, if you use XPO on Samarin, um, you can inject your XPO object in your view model, and it already notifies the property change. So you don't have to do that much code. To use XPO on Xamarin is a beauty. 
It is. No, you know, I don't, I don't have to explain. <laughs> You've been through that. It really is. Okay, so let's move to the next, um, to the next best practice. So it's number two. And actually, you can just click quickly, Jose, on the XPO Simplified Property Syntax. That's a link that it will actually explain yes. everything that we just talked about. Okay. So. Yeah, in here they explain actually in a proper technical way why this works like that. So if you have the time, just read it. I think it's like really small. Yeah, it's a nice article, so I will definitely recommend it. Okay, so I mean, you will put the, I, I guess you will put the links of, for this. Yeah. The, okay, so let's move to the third. So the third uh, best practice is um, set the XPO default data layer at the beginning of your application. Uh, what that means is that the first time that you try to access a persistent object in any way, a data layer is created. And if you don't have a, a default data layer, one will be created all the time. And that's really, uh, is like a costly operation on resources. So, and also it can lead to something like uh, the mix mag, mi no, sorry. What was the name of that? Mix match session, Se uh, session yeah. exception. So uh, for people who use stuff, all of this is handled for you. You don't even have to think about it. But right now that more, more people is starting to use XPO on Xamarin, su for example, you do need to understand how XPO works. So in general, at the beginning of your application, if you're using purely XPO, just um, access your connection stream and then you should create the, the default data layer. And that data layer will be shared between all the sessions or you need to fork in the application. So it reduces the cost of, of creating a new data layer all the time. And also it will reduce the, the probability of having a mixed um, session exception. So uh, in general, uh, I think most people have never seen something like this because uh, people uh, in general think that XP and SAF are the same tool and they are not the same. You can use XPO without SAF. So this is like the, um, what will you do in a normal Windows Forms application maybe, or maybe in a ASP.NET application that at the beginning of your application, you, will, you should define your data layer. Is, is there any shortcut in, in Kotox to create that uh, code? Actually, no, but we can create one because we have, you cannot imagine how many shortcuts and Actually, I do have one. I don't use it that much, but um, I have one who do all the plumbing, like all the the code that you need to start a, a, an XPO application. I, I even create some classes in the, I mean, it's like, it's a huge shortcut. We'll create like, I don't know, like a copy for application for you. So, so you can just start um, working. I use it for my demos because you don't want the people to watch you write each property one by one. So I have a huge shortcut that handles all of that. We don't have something that handles this exactly. But I think that a nice thing maybe to show is that you can copy that in Visual Studio and right click and generate template for Crunch, for Code Rush right there. And well, you will have the snippet in two seconds. So you can actually create your own snippet so you don't have to like repeat code that you're using all the time. And regarding uh, using SAF in XPO like the same tool, you can use, uh, you can use uh, XPO without SAF for sure in WinForms, in console application, in ASP, and you can use SAF with entity framework. So they are actually not completely, uh, completely tied together. Yeah, I mean, they look like they are the same tool, but they are not. And to answer exactly Rafael's question is like, there is nothing for that at the moment, uh, officially but most people create their own shortcuts. Actually, we, with Javier, we have a lot of shortcuts that uh, some of them, most of them are public somewhere. And we need to actually work in that, Javier, to put all of them together, all on the same repository and 
continue working the same because we have several versions of it. So yeah, most probably we have to do a repository with all our shortcuts and that also the community can add shortcuts there as well. So we yeah. have a big one that everybody who creates a new one could put it there. Yeah, exactly. So I, Javier, since he is the one who handled everything here around here, he will put it on his notes and we will <laughs> make a video about that soon. Um, okay, is there something else that you want to... Uh, yeah, one thing that I don't want to... Uh, that I was uh, listening when you were explaining about the data layer that every time that you create a new one, a new connection to the database that get created, you also have to think that uh, databases have connection limits. So every time that you are adding a new connection, a new connection, at some point it will uh, throw an exception. At some point it won't allow you to create a new connection. So that's another way, that's another reason why this is a best practice. Use your, uh, set your default data layer in the beginning of the application. Okay, uh, now let's go to the number three. Uh, number four. Ah, number four. Okay, hold on because I moved this, uh, hold on, where were we? Three and Scroll four. down, yeah. Yeah, the, the thing is that uh, if you see the indentation, it's wrong. <laughs> That's why it doesn't look like it's part of the, of the big list. Okay, so uh, the fourth uh, best practice is to use a unit of work instead of the, no, 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 no. hold on. Um, it's a new session of unit of work every time that you are loading, modifying, and saving data. So every time, like in a SAF, every time that we open a new view, that we're gonna do a, a separate a transaction for loading data, modifying, saving, we should use a, diff, a different session or a different unit of work. And that will allow us uh, avoiding the mixing, mixing session and section. And also we need to also think about that XPO cache object so that way you won't have these uh, data inconsistencies. Good, I mean, you, you saved me because I was a little bit lost. I mean, because I was moving the screen. Okay, so there is another thing that I want to add here is that in general, uh, I think it's a good principle to use a unit of work session for each of your windows or of your root windows. If you're going to, for example, have a grid of customers, that grid should use one session and then you should pass that if you're going to open a form. And you, there is something that I just learned recently that's been there for years and years, but it just hit me in the face like a few weeks ago, is that um, also when you're having multiple windows and you want to communicate the objects between multiple windows, you should use the new unit of work or session for the root window. And from then on, you should use a nested unit of work. I never see the, I never seen before the 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 need to use a nested unit of work. But I was working in in summary in a summary forms application, and I need to to do a master detail detail. So in order to communicate the third detail with the first root, you need to have a nested unit of work. So. Um, uh, I think that in general is a big, uh, uh, one of the best practices and that is not a must, but of course it will make your life easier if you follow. It's not like the other ones that actually you really have to do it. Uh, this one is optional, but uh, this is the, of course the best practice. Is there anything else that you want to add uh, on this one, Javier? No, I think that this is connected to the next point about uh, not using the default session. Because again, every time that you create a new uh, object or a new collection, if you don't specify the session as we uh, talk in one of the first point about the constructor need to have a session, it will use the static uh, variable that is coming from the XPO default uh, session. So are you, if you are using that, there is a big chance that is being used other places as well. So it will give you the session mixing a section. So it's a good uh, practice not to use that default session. And it's the five, Jose. We move to the six, it's the five one, that one that I'm, this one. Okay. Okay, so, uh, well, you already explained that. I don't know what else to add for that, but uh, I guess we should move to the sixth one. That's it's like, I think like really simple, the, the fifth. Yeah. So let's go ahead to the sixth. Um, 
Okay, uh, first I was in XPO since day one. The first day the, there was no unit of work, as I recall, or at least I didn't find it so easily. So in general, uh, basically in, if you're using a session, it's like you're using a direct open connection to the database. Every time that you do save, there is a query that goes to the database and update whatever you're doing. But if you're using a unit of work, you need to work, uh, it's like the concept of a transaction. All the objects that belong to, a, to a, an unit of work um, are attached to the, to the, to like one listener. So the unit of work will track every change done in all the objects. And when you do commit changes of the unit of work, it will open a transaction, an explicit transaction to the database for just like one microsecond, millisecond, you name it, and commit the, all the changes at once. So it's not that you have a, a, an open connection to the database that I think is the case with the session. So in general, that prevents like memory leaks and also allows you to follow the transactional pattern. I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, no, that that, that makes perfectly sense. So, unit of work. If you do uh, multiple changes, you wait for that you actually save to actually commit everything to a database. So, uh, and th th there is something else that I want to highlight in here. Most people, especially when they are using SAF, they in, in SAF you use the object space, right? And here you use session of unit of work. Okay. Um, regarding that, uh, if we check any of the persistent objects. Okay, we have this in the constructor, right? So this is the base class. If we do unit of work, let's uh, do something like a method in here. And let's declare a unit of work. Okay, so if we check the base for this object, is the session. So basically it's like a super session, an inheritance session, a uh, session with in asteroids. So there is something that you might not know that maybe what you're receiving in the constructor, constructor is not a unit of work. Maybe, sorry, sorry. Uh, maybe what you're receiving in the constructor is not a session, it's a unit of work actually. But since unit of work is a child or descendant of session, it will fit Beautiful. in that variable. So yeah. if you're using SAF, you can like um, do get type to see the real type of what it is. And I think it will be a need of work, not a session actually. So it's just like that because it's the common base. And in SAF, you have something like, uh, there is an interface that will inject the object space. So you work all the time at the same level because Object space session and you need to work. Uh, um, people get confused about them because if you're using a view controller in SAF, you're writing an XPO object space. I mean, that's the instance that you're having. And here is a session. So people get confused how the object space is related to the session or to the need of work. Actually, the object space is, is not a descendant of the session or the need of work is something different, but um, the unit of work is basically a super session with more enhanced functionality. Rafa, do you have any question? No, I'm good. Okay. okay. So let's see the next one, Jose. Okay. Just one sec. So let's move to number seven. Oh, I love this one. Uh, you want to explain it or, or I do explain it? I, I can I can start and you can yeah, uh, yeah. say anything that I'm missing. So I actually did a video a few days back about the new feature on 20.1 about XPO database schema migration. And I refer to this uh, best practice because in a multi-tenant application where you have several users using the application, it's not advisable to allow them each one to update the schema. That can bring uh, undecided uh, results. So actually, if you create a new SAF application and you check the event data, mismatch, something, uh, you will see that they are only allowing the update schema with the, when the debugger is attached. So they are doing it only for development purpose. So 
a good recommendation is to have a separate console application, a separate WinForms application, anything you want, but a separate application only for handling data by maintenance and schema update. And that's a, actually a really nice uh, advice, a really nice practice to follow. That way, right there, you have only one place where your database admin or anyone can update your database, can do uh, the maintenance of database or everything, anything else you need. So again, le that's one of the best uh, practice that we have right here. Actually, if you use the DV updater in tool for SAF, uh, they do something like this. I mean, they do more checks than that. This is the most, I mean, this is the raw concept. Uh, you should check other stuff. But if you're starting, I mean, uh, with an empty database, it's not that much of a problem that if you need to update the schema of something that is already running, which is not, I mean, you need to be more careful about it. And well, in general, like, um, also I get a lot of questions about this, but not with XPO or with SAF. They say like, why they don't create the database when, when I do the release? And uh, is that... What happened? I think that Jose, his laptop battery died or something. So, okay, everybody, we're back. We had some technical issues on Jose's side, but we are good to go now. So, Jose, please feel free to continue. Okay, um, sorry, guys. Uh, I mean, I'm using a lot of virtual machines, and sometimes a virtual machine inside of a virtual machine. So, I don't see the notifications of the battery. So, I run out of battery. Okay, so uh, let's go back to the. Um, to the practice number seven, which was the update schema, you need to have a, a separate application in general, or you need to include this piece of code in the beginning of your application. The main problem with including this is that it will trigger all the time. So you will need to double check somehow that the, um, the state of the database. Actually, the update scheme is quite smart. Uh, it will not do any changes that will affect your database as long as what you did makes sense the main problem is when you change something you change the name of a table and you didn't do the rename the constraint will point to another place and blah 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 and everything will explode so in general um, most of the changes are quite safe if you work in a consistent manner and if you didn't um, of course you will have troubles in any way you proceed not only because you didn't use the updater. I mean, they, they called for updating the schema. And in SAF, this is hidden somehow. Uh, but if you see the program and the global attacks, uh, you will be able to see something like this. At least you will able to see when it's called, but you will not see the implementation. But the implementation is something like this, but obviously with more uh, checks. Is there, oh, and also, well, Javier, you did the, the video on the new migration pattern. So that's something that you need to keep an eye, an eye uh, over it because depending on the organization that you're working for, uh, how you will update the schema or create your initial schema will change. I mean, if you're working for a bank where they have a dedicated DVA, they will uh, ask you to follow some rules. So it's better that you understand this code. Uh, I tell you this because uh, I used to live in El Salvador before and we used to do projects for government agencies and big enterprise somehow, at least Salvadorian enterprise. And all of those companies have a team of developers, they have a DBA and so on, so on, so on. So um, you need to, to understand what the schema the, the, the code that update the schema is doing because you might have to explain it. Uh, it was one of the case for me that they say like, what does this do? How does this work? I mean, how will we will create the, the, the initial schema. So um, if you're using stuff, you might not, in general, you don't need to know this, but, um, uh, but it's also good to have it because when something breaks or when you need to draw modification, you at least will know on which layer you need to do it. So, uh, and then keep an eye 
open for the new for the new method, which I don't know if it's considered already part of uh, the the release or is is experimental or something. You check it more than me, Javier. Is this experimental? It's yes. CTP right now. Ah, okay, so so it's preview at the moment. Yeah, it, it can have some variation on the API, but I believe that they are releasing 20.1 now in May. So we are so close. I don't think that two modes are going to change from here to when they actually release. I do believe that it's a really uh, neat uh, implementation. You have right there, if you are a new field, because HPO don't send remove or do anything, drop nothing. But if you are a new field or something like that, it will give you the diff of that query. So you will only get the alter script. So that's great. We used to do for a client a lot of structure synchronization. We didn't use the DB updated for that one. We just do a structure synchronization and then uh, change the module info table to the new values. But I think that the, that was using Navicat, that is a paid product that was using some other tools. Now it's coming uh, out of the box with XPO. So that means that it's not attached to SQL Server or MySQL. It, go, it comes to a different a set of provider implementation. And right now, they don't have everything. They just have like Oracle, I think SQL Server, MySQL, Postgres, like six or seven. But I'm pretty sure they will uh, increase that to the 14, 15 database provider that they have. So that's, I, in my uh, opinion, wait, that's really neat. You, you should say like 20 because like there is like the 14 official and then, all the yeah. other things that we have done. I agree, I agree. Um, yeah. uh, and also I, I need, yeah, you, you, uh, what you said is like uh, totally correct that most of the people that have to do this, the, the migration difference, they use a specialized tool and those tools are expensive. And now it comes out of the box because we use one for Oracle, I think it's Toad or something like that. I'm not a DBA, so, but um, I do remember that the tool was expensive and it's a separate tool outside of .NET and everything. So if XPO will provide that out of the box, good. I mean, you don't have to pay for that. They have an amazing support. You can ask whatever you want to them. I mean, not whatever you want, whatever they make sense. But uh, in general, it's, it's a new tool for your tool, tool belt, which I think that for me, XPO, if you have ever watched um, the really, really old uh, TV show Batman, the one from the 70s, the Batman have a, like, like a tool, uh, tool belt with tricks. So that's what XPO is for me uh, somehow. So that's just a new tool in your tool belt in general. And it comes for free somehow. So um, I don't know if that will come with the Nougat actually, if that will work in the in the free version of XPO. But I I believe so. Actually the implementation is just two, two new interfaces that they are implementing on the providers. So that yeah. should come with the... So it will Google. come with the free version and with the one that yeah. is with the universal, oh, amazing. So uh, we need to really take a look to it and maybe do migrations for several databases to see how it works. Because for Oracle is different than for SQL Server and so on. So uh, let's put that in the notes. Definitely. And I think we're ready to go to the last. Um, and in here, Javier, um, I was checking this and this I will change. Maybe we should tell them that they should update this, this article. This article is from 2005, I think. Let me check you know, it. The, the funny thing is that I have seen lately a couple of support tickets, a couple uh, articles saying 19 years ago. I, that can be right because they were actually XPO in their article interview with the team started like a official release in 2003. So 19 years ago is like 2001. I think that, I don't know yeah. if that's right or maybe they have something yeah, in something their side. They, yeah, because I, I've seen like some of them that say like 19 years ago also. <laughs> I'm just curious about it. Okay, so this is a, a, another article like from 2005. So now a little bit of .NET history with this. Okay, um, there are several things in here. I mean, there, in, the topic number A is uh, they show you the weights on how to create a criteria operator. Okay, when XPO was first released, I think was .NET 1.1, 1 
And then at that moment, there was no other way to query data. I mean, there was no link or support for Lambda expressions. So you need to create your, your, your query expression with objects. So, and they also have a way to parse the expression back to, to an object. I mean, from text to object. And, the, and I mean, both ways. But in general, if you see, for example, here, let's see, check the first line. They are creating a criteria operator for the property unit price. And the unit price should be equals to, oh no, greater or equal than 20. So if you see, I mean, this do make sense, especially if you're a beginner, because if, if you have a query that uh, that is composed by several conditions to specify all the conditions I mean, uh, a part of each other is quite nice. It makes you understand them better, but it looks like a lot of code also. So in general, I'm not using criteria operators that much anymore. What I'm using is link queries in general, which I think are more somehow fluent and they support refactor. And also other stuff about this is that right now we have the name of in C sharp at least, because I don't remember if that works in Visual Basic. I think it should work in Visual Basic also, but um, but in here you have the projects of magic strings that if this property change, I mean, you rename it in the code in, the, in that class, then you might not rename it in the criteria and it will fail, it will break. So they say in here that, uh, say like, oh, this is safe, this is safe. And the last one is not safe at all. I mean, so in general, uh, I guess we should ask Dennis or someone in the Dev Express team to update this one because this is quite old, it's still valid, but there are better ways. Um, so in general, it's like when you create a criteria operator, first I will, for beginners, I will tell them to use this approach. The first line exactly as it is like that. And if you're more experienced. The only thing that we can change there instead of unit using unit price we name can of use name of and then, then it will be like really really safe still it will be like a lot of code and then you will have to concatenate with the logical operation like and or and so on right but um but for the beginners is good they will understand which condition are they applying to the create. i think that then it put a, an article about there is a code rush uh shortcut or the code rush uh, command where you actually just right click and it change all your string and your properties for the name of equivalent. Well, I mean, I'm going to look for it and I'm going to put it on the description yeah, of the video. I actually think that that should be Mark Miller's, I mean, black magic, yeah. <laughs> because he's the one who do the, those stuff. But in general, I mean, if you're a beginner, if you're starting with, with XPO at this moment, because you're using it in summary or something like that, uh, I will strongly suggest that you use the first approach. Uh, some other approach is something like this that I will use sometimes. Uh, basically this one, the fourth one, but this is not safe at all because this is just a string. Uh, and here you can write whatever you want. You can write your name and it will crash actually. So, uh, so Jose, can we show the link implementation on code quickly? Uh, sure, uh, one sec, let me go to the studio. I think, yes, it's open here. So, okay. Um, is this working? Let's compile it. Ooh. <laughs> uh, hold on, um, I'm going to delete this class and I, I think it, like it was open and I didn't save it, this solution before the, I had the power shortcut, the, I mean, short touch. And let's see. Ta -ta. Okay, it's working. Oh, but it's missing the XPO reference, that's why. Do... I think actually the, there's the, uh, 21 is already there. If you see the number, it's already released. It's not, see, I mean, a previous or anything. Uh, see, I'm not using the previous. So oh, 20, nice. 20 is already outside. So uh, let's do all of this in one single file. 
I will get a XC, which is a persistent object, and this will be customer. Then we will have uh, XPS name, and XPB is active. And that's it. So um, I'm not going to do, I mean, it will not, well, no, let's do it. I mean, it's quite easy. So uh, here, so they said that we need. Yeah, I'm seeing in my downloads manager, 20.1.3 was released April 30. Okay, so we can create a new fork. Usually we name this like this. We have the new fork. And uh, let's do here query, and then you uh, write the type, which will be customer in this case. OK, so this is a method. It will return you a query object, but you can use it from here um, on, I mean. And then you can do where, which is the most simple case, but you can do more complicated stuff, actually. That's what I like about this. And where C is our customer is function of customer dot, uh, oh, the name is the same, so C. <laughs> yeah, and they, my keyboard is not, maybe it's because it's, Sunday. Okay, C of C. Why is this not? Okay, hold on. Let me just compile this. Okay, so need to work. Query. Customer. Where? X. Yeah, X. This, oh. <laughs> Every letter that I use brings something X is. It's type name. Let's see. No. Why I don't see it? I mean, let's see. Class is in the same namespace. Because I don't see the. Um... Oh, let's do something. I think it's going crazy because of that. So x is function of x dot. I still don't see it. Uh, oh, yeah. Hold on. And let me move this to a file. This is something that I do with my eyes closed. But you know that when you're doing a demonstration live, everything starts to break. <laughs> Uh, okay, so It's asking for a criteria operator. It should be asking uh -huh. for a. It should be, yes, that's, that's actually. Let's see. It's XPO object, so it's, I mean, this is good. But why is this asking for a criteria? Okay. It's because here we have the wrong namespace. That's why. Hmm. Okay. Um, using. Okay, and now this should work. Where, right yes, there. there it is. X is a function of X dot name equals Jose and X is active equals true. Okay, so this will be like the modern approach. And for me, it's easier to read. 
And if you have several conditions, you don't have to write one line with an, one operator for each of them, because when you do criteria operators, if you have more than one condition, it becomes really big, actually. So if you want to simplify it, you can do something like this, of course. Um, a lot of people have problems understanding link in general, but once you get used to it, because I think like it's, it's about getting used to it, it's quite simple actually. And it's safe for refactor and it doesn't have the problems of magic strings also. Um, and they can also be created dynamically. I mean, there is a tool for that. I mean, that tool is somehow um, a little bit mysterious, but it's there. I mean, and I think we should do a video about that. You should put it on the nose that there is a way to to parse uh, to get the lambda function from from a string. There are several ways to do that, and there are also several projects that handles the the parsing of of lambda functions from a string. So, Developer Express they do provide one tool. I don't know if it's like uh, if there is a documentation for it, but I know that it's there because I have I I used it before. So maybe in another video we'll show that. And I don't know if there's something else that you want to add about the, the criteria operators. No, that pretty much covers everything. Unless Rafa has something to ask, we are good to move forward. Yeah, go ahead and move forward. I'm good. Okay. So I think that's it because uh, I think Javier, this, uh, we will see it in a different video because it's quite extensive. So, but I, guys, for the next video, we will talk about the. Um, the etiquette of what you should do on persistent objects for enterprise applications. So that's the next topic. Um, okay, so. Okay, so that will be it. So thank you for sticking with us and see you in the next video. Okay.